You know what I find funny? Do you know what I find absolutely hilarious every day of my wasted life? If you just thought mainstream history, archaeology, science, etc., then that is exactly what is a laugh riot every day of my life. It is hilarious. So in this series right now, we have countless cultures where we have physical evidence. It's right there. It is not. There's no question. It's right there. We have the calendars. We have the traditions. It's right there. The proof that the year was at some point in time, only a couple of thousand years ago, 360 days. We have all of this scientific evidence and none of those mainstream institutions pay attention to any of it. They completely ignore all of it. All of it is completely ignored so that they can push whatever garbage theory they have about some interpretation that they have developed to explain away the real hard scientific evidence right in front of them. And every day it is a challenge for me to not run around and start slapping mainstream historians and scientists and whatever. See, this is how I know that I am going to heaven or Valhalla or whatever honorable place that people like me need to go because look at the amount of restraint that I have in the face of such ridiculousness from the mainstream situation. Okay, all right, all right. Let's go on with more proof, more solid, unequivocal proof that Earth had an orbit around the sun, our current sun, not the old sun, that's a different sun, that was Saturn, different. But at this period in time, only a couple of thousand years ago, Earth was orbiting around the sun for 360 days. Now during this period of time, right before the calendar ends up changing, I believe Earth was in a much better state biologically than we are today. So by that I mean like the forests were larger and more lush, the prehistoric animals, they were still running around having a good time. You know, every, everything was more bountiful during this period of time. So humans were living technically probably a much better life. Also, oh yeah, there would have been a higher oxygen count at this point in time as well. Because Venus hadn't shown up yet and burned all of the oxygen up when it rained oil down on Earth. So yeah, just painting the picture. So it's funny, all the people that go through these changes, the changes being when Venus shows up, you know, when the Earth's orbit begins to cross with Venus's orbit. I guess it'd probably be more like Earth's orbit, whatever. When Earth and Venus, their orbits cross, this is where everything goes to hell in a handbasket, right? But it's interesting to think that right before this period of time, I mean, people had gone through a lot of stuff before all of this, right? You would have had the deluge. Uh, you would have had other kinds of messed up catastrophes as well. But Earth was still a very highly livable place, especially compared to today, right? And that's all based on science. That's not just me pulling this concept out of my ass. This is legitimate science, right? We know that the Earth had a higher oxygen content only a few thousand years ago, right? We know that the Sahara Desert was not a desert a few thousand years ago, for example, right? This is just real science. So when you're imagining these events taking place, remember their world was way different compared to our world. And I don't just mean like society and structure wise. I mean, the planet itself was different. These people had their entire world, maybe quite literally, flipped upside down. Everything they had known was absolutely destroyed and ruined when the catastrophe happens that changes the calendar. I mean, hell, right? Even their calendar changes. Anyway, let's get into the Velikovsky stuff. He goes over a lot more evidence, physical evidence. He'll start talking about temples and the way temples are oriented, etc that continues to prove and that continues to give us evidence that the year was different, right? This is not something that we can just ignore. It has to be accounted for. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in the middle of this section with Velikovsky and Worlds in Collision. All right. As we have already said, there is, in the Talmud, the information that the Temple of Solomon was built so that on the equinoctical days of the year, the direction of the rays of the rising sun could be tested. A gold plate or disc was affixed to the eastern gate. Through it, the rays of the rising sun fell into the heart of the temple. 
the festival of the tabernacle, was originally an equinoctical festival, as Exodus 23.16 and 34.22 state explicitly, celebrated during the last seven days of the year and immediately preceding the New Year's Day, the day of the fall equinox, upon the tenth of the seventh month. In other words, the New Year's Day, or the day of the autumnal equinox, was observed on the tenth day of the seventh month, the day when the sun rose exactly in the east and set exactly in the west, the day of the atonement falling on the same day. Thereafter, the day of the new year was moved back to the first day of the seventh month. We may note that not only on the Jewish calendar, but also according to the Babylonian tablets, the equinoctical dates were displaced by nine days. One tablet says that in the spring day and night are equal on the 15th of the month of Nisan. Another tablet says that it takes place on the 6th of the same month. This indicates that the change in the calendar of the feasts observed in Jerusalem followed astronomical changes. So basically, you can compare calendars, two different calendars, that have these weird dates, but once you see one calendar changing their dates because of an astronomical event, then you can understand why another calendar changed its or why another people changed, yeah, why another people changed their calendar, even though they didn't tell us, right? So in, in, the, in the Hebrew texts at this point, they don't specifically say why the dates changed, but we can match that up with the Babylonian tablets, and we can start to understand why they had to make the change. Did I insult your intelligence enough right there? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure that we're all hating each other here. All right, the eastern gate of the Temple of Jerusalem was no longer correctly oriented after the cardinal points had become displaced. On his ascension to the throne, following the death of Ahaz, Hezekiah inaugurated a sweeping religious reformation. Uh, 2 Chronicles 29, 3FF says... He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Apparently, the natural changes in terrestrial rotation, which took place in the days of Uzziah, and again on the day of the burial of Ahaz, necessitated a reform. Hezekiah, therefore, gathered the priests into the east street, and spoke to them, saying that our fathers have trespassed and have shut up the doors of the porch. In the pre-exilic period, it was held to be of imperative necessity that on two days of the year, the sun shone directly through the eastern gate. And through all the eastern gates of the temple arranged in a line directly into the very heart of the temple proper. The eastern gate, also called Sun Gate, served not only to check on the equinoxes when the sun rises exactly in the east, but on the solstices as well. A device on the eastern gate was designed to reflect the first rays of the sun on the summer and winter solstices, when the sun rises in the southeast and in the northeast, respectively. According to Talmudic authorities, the early prophets experienced much difficulty in making this arrangement work. Yeah, okay, that would make sense, right? Things were messed up at that point. All right. From biblical times, vestiges of three calendar systems remain. And this assumes a special interest in view of the fact we noted some pages back. Namely, that the tablets from Nineveh record three different systems of solar and planetary movements, each of which is complete in itself and differs from the others at every point. Now right there, that's important. Because what we have right there is we have 
actual physical evidence of a civilization that was not dumb, that knew what they were doing. These people were not running around bonking into walls. They were not, you know, sniffing their feet and hopping around. You know, they weren't doing dumb stuff. These people were charting the planetary orbits, right? They knew what they were doing. They were calculating. They were, anyway, they were doing all that crazy stuff and they obviously recorded what they saw. Now, what they saw obviously differs from what we have now. What's even more interesting about this whole situation with those tablets from Nineveh is that they have three different configurations that go in a chronological order. So that actually helps us paint a picture about where the planets were and how they, how they moved throughout the, the solar system and how they may have interacted with other planets as well, not just Earth. I mean, obviously Earth gets absolutely slapped around, but there's other planets up in the sky as well at this point in time that are also interacting with one another. And some of those planets, we may never have even seen the interactions that happened because, hey, maybe we were on the other side of the sun or something. Ah, that's also one of the other weird... Ah, one of the problems that I have with some of this stuff is that when we try to find all the names for all the planets, there's discrepancies, right? You'll have multiple names for one planet. My question is, was there other planets up there that we don't see now that the reason why the names are different is because they were, you know, taken out basically, either kicked out of orbit or destroyed or, you know, I don't know. It's just... That gets a little weird. Anyway, so the fact that we have three separate charts of three different planetary orbits, I mean, that's just amazing, right? I mean, the mainstream, this is what this this is what makes me want to start choking, is, is that they just ignore this. They just, oh no, Babylonian people, they were dumb. They didn't know what they were doing. No, no! These people back in the day knew exactly what they were recording. Don't ignore it. All right, let's go on. It appears that the adjustment of the calendar following the initiation of the New World Order in the days of Hezekiah was a long and tedious process. As late as 100 years after Hezekiah, during the Babylonian exile, in the days of Solon and Thales, Jeremiah, Baruch, and Ezekiel drew up the calendar from year to year. When the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile, they brought with them their present calendar, in which the months are called by Assyrio-Babylonian names. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will do make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, reads the closing chapter of the book of Isaiah. All flesh will come to worship the Lord from one noon to another and from one Sabbath to another. The new heavens means a sky with constellations or luminaries in new places. The prophet promises that the new sky will be everlasting and that the months will keep forever their established order. Right, right there. So, okay. So, people, I mean, it's like all this stuff is right there, right? Everything was jumbled up. They literally had to deal with trying to figure out, like, ah, oh, okay. Daniel, the Jewish sage at the court of Nebuchadnezzar, king of the exile, when blessing the Lord, said to the king, He changeth the times and the seasons. This is a remarkable sentence, which is also preserved in many Jewish prayers. By the change of seasons, or appointed dates, is meant an alteration in the order of nature, with shifting of celestial and equinoctical dates and the festivals connected with them. The change of times could refer not only to the last change, but to the previous ones also. And it was the change of the times of the seasons that was followed by calendar reforms. I've got to wonder, how do people that like hate on religious texts, right? Those people who made it their entire lives to be a cringe lord atheist, like... Do they just explain, how do they explain passages like this? I guess they just write it off really quick as like, oh, it's just religious stupidity or whatever, right? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not religious, by the way, or anything. It's just, it's just something I find interesting that if you are going to come across 
stories like this that actually have historical value regardless of kind of what they're saying. I mean, Babylon existed. These are, you know, we have, here's some history right here. Something went down. Yes, I realize it might be in a Hebrew text or a Bible text or whatever, but that doesn't discount them from being a valid point of history, right? So it's unfortunate that cringe lord atheists will completely ignore this stuff. But I got to wonder on the religious side of people, how do, you, how do they explain that? Like, do they just read texts and chapters like that and they're like oh yeah the earth just you know he just changed the months yeah he's god he can do whatever he want he changes the months here and there he just does it and you know whatever dude is that is that how religious people approach that do they just oh yeah god did it and then they move on with life see both sides are guilty right here right All right that's why it's important to come at it from a neutral perspective because right here yeah i get it's a religious text sort of but it's also a historical text and right there we get good information, right? And we do not want to discount good information, especially when it lines up with everybody else's information all over the planet. So I just said all that just to teach a lesson that all of you probably already know. All right, let's keep going. I might as well just change this show's title to Wasting Your Time and Treating You Like a Moron. <laughs> all right, uh, let's carry on. The old Hindu astronomical observations offer a set of calculations different from those of the present day. What is extraordinary are the durations assigned to the synodical revolutions to meet in Hindu astronomy with a set of numerical quantities widely differing from those generally accepted is indeed so startling that one at first feels strongly inclined to doubt of the soundness of the text. Moreover, each figure is given twice over. In the astronomical work of Vahura Mihira, the recorded synodical revolutions of the planets, which are easy to calculate against the background of the fixed stars, are about five days too short for Saturn, over five days too short for Jupiter, 11 days too short for Mars, eight or nine days too short for Venus, less than two days too short for Mercury. In a solar system in which the Earth revolves around the Sun in 360 days, the synodical periods of Jupiter and Saturn would be about five days shorter than they are at present and that of Mercury less than two days shorter. But Mars and Venus of the synodical table of the Vahara Mihara must have had orbits different from their present ones, even if the terrestrial year was only 360 days. Calendric changes in India were affected in the 7th century at the time as in China also, the 10th month year was supplanted by a 12 month year. That's amazing, right? So, I mean, everybody has a 10 month year at a certain period of time, and then all the crazy stuff happens, which is recorded, and we can see all the evidence on Earth. We'll have to cover that later. But, uh, you know, everything is there, and, and it's ignored. Why is this ignored? Okay, going on. In the 8th century, a calendar reform was made in Egypt. We have already referred to a cataclysm during the reign of the pharaoh Osorkron II of the Libyan dynasty. Another disturbance of a cosmic nature took place a few decades later, still in the time of the Libyan dynasty. In the 15th year of the reign of Sosek III, there occurred a remarkable prodigy of uncertain nature, but in some way connected with the moon. The contemporaneous document written by the royal son, the high priest Osorkon reads, In the year 15, fourth month, of the third season, 25th day, under the majesty of his august father, the divine ruler of Thebes, before heaven devoured the moon. Great wrath rose this land. Great wrath arose in this land. 
I don't know how Egypt sounded back then. I don't know what they were talking. I don't know. Maybe they had Brooklyn accents. Maybe they sounded like Old English. I have no idea. Nobody, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. Soon after, Osokron introduced a new calendar of offerings. The mutilated condition of the inscription makes it impossible to determine the exact nature of the calendric reform. Ain't that a bitch? Every time, man, we always lose information. There's always stuff just absolutely torn apart, shredded, or stolen, or whatever. Every time. Ugh, all right. It appears that the same or similar disturbance in the movement of the moon is the subject of an Assyrian inscription, which speaks of the moon being obstructed on its way. Day and night it was handicapped. In its August station it did not stand. Because of the duration of the phenomenon, it is concluded that it could not mean an eclipse of the moon. Now that's important because so often, man, when you start to read and you start to see what mainstream people try to write this kind of stuff off as, it's always some sort of ridiculous eclipse that couldn't have happened back then anyway, especially if the mainstream cosmology is correct. So, you know, dates get screwed up. And so they eventually just throw this stuff to the side, right? Eventually there's kind of a point to where mainstream literally gives up and they're just like, ah, everybody's just smoking crack. They didn't know what they were talking about. The moon got, the moon was obstructed. Yeah, bro, past the crack pipe, right? That's exactly what mainstream people eventually get to the point of when they're trying to explain what people back in the day were doing, right? Everybody just on constant drugs i guess ah, okay at the end of the 8th or the beginning of the 7th century before the present era the people of rome introduced a calendar reform in the preceding section we referred to ovid's statement in fasti concerning the reform of romulus who divided the year into 10 months and the reform of numa who prefixed two months Plutarch's Life of Numa contains the following passage, part of which has already been quoted. He, Numa, applied himself also to the adjustment of the calendar, not with exactness, and yet not altogether without careful observation. For during the reign of Romulus, they had been irrational and irregular in their fixing of the months reckoning some at less than 20 days, some at 35, and some at more. They had no idea of the inequality in the annual motions of the sun and the moon, but held to the principle only that the year should consist of 360 days. Numa reformed the calendar, and the correction of the inequality which he made was destined to require other and greater corrections in the future. He also changed the order of the months. Numa was a contemporary of Hezekiah. So that ends this section on this Velikovsky reading. But the takeaway here is, is that we have temples all over this planet that are oriented to a completely different equinoctical state that our planet used to exist in. Now, that's no joke. We can't ignore that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff that mainstream just ignores and pushes off to the side. Why? Because it's extraordinarily inconvenient for their their entire like scientific and, and, and historical narrative, right? They can't admit that it's entirely possible that when our ancestors say that the year was different, that the year was indeed composed of 360 days, and the year and the and the earth was on a completely different axis, that they are being completely honest and they are recording what they went through, that they are actually trying to tell us what happened. Now, I'll wrap this up, but don't forget, everything being postulated here, you know, a different year length, a different possible orientation of the Earth's axis, a different orbital location than what we have now, all of this stuff is scientifically possible. It does not go up against science. There's no reason why that could not have been the case. The only reason that we fight it nowadays, or at least most people fight it nowadays, 
is because that's how we've been trained to look at the entire situation. We have now been trained that the theory of uniformity is, you know, the end all be all of everything. That everything takes place, you know, over a bajillion years and nothing ever changes. Like that is ridiculous. All right. That's enough of this. Just keep an open mind as we keep going through this stuff. And as you start to get presented with all of this evidence, just remember everything that I'm going to be showing you guys is all scientifically possible. I think that's kind of the main thing to remember is that everything we talk about has a basis in scientific possibility, right? This is not fantasy. All right, we'll keep going with the next thing later or whatever. All right.